I'm here tonight with Mary Ballou. It's January 25th in her home in Henderson, Nevada, and I'm Pam Frazier. Um, let's begin, Mary, with, tell me a little bit about your early home life. Well, I was the tenth of eleven children, um, but when I can remember, my uh, oldest brother was already gone from home, he was on his mission. But I can remember when he returned. That's one of my first memories. And uh, I thought, my, what a tall, good-looking man he was. <laughs> and found out later he's pretty short. <laughs> anyway, um, I can remember my uh, oldest sister getting married and uh, went through the rest of them. Um, during the Depression in the 30s, uh, I had uh, oh, five or six of the siblings, the older siblings, were already married. And it was a real tough time for everyone. They couldn't find work. And they'd get work part-time, and then they would, when they couldn't find work, they moved back into Mom and Dad's house with the rest of us. Well, the house wasn't all that big, but um, we made room and made do, and sometimes I had a room to myself, and sometimes I had a bed down in my folks' room. <laughs> no telling where we were. <laughs> but um, uh, one time I think we had at least three uh, different families move back uh, because they didn't have any jobs. So we had a little summer house across a back porch from the house and it was a fairly good sized room to where they could really set up housekeeping and, and, and have kind of a one room apartment for themselves. And that was always full of some one of the kids in their lives. So, but it was, you know, I'm young enough and I went along with it. <laughs> and, and things were all right with me. I, I pitied the poor married kids having to do that. <laughs> But now, uh, it didn't make any difference to me. But uh, we had a good home life, I thought. I did, you know. I was uh, the youngest girl, only two other girls. And um, it was, uh, my oldest sister was a little perturbed when my mother was pregnant with me. But uh, when I turned out to be a girl, why, I was welcomed, you know. Everything was fine. But then she got pregnant again with my uh, younger brother, and uh, she was really put out then. And then when he turned out to be another boy, uh, she didn't talk to mom for quite a while. <laughs> she was so put out with that. <laughs> she didn't need any more kids. Mom said that once she told her that the neighbors would think they needed a new rug better <laughs> more than they needed another baby. <laughs> And I don't know, I, I'm sure I didn't blame her. <laughs> I would have done worse, but it had been reversed. It was a good thing Millie was the oldest, because she was the one that could put up with the rest of us and had a better temperament. <laughs> it was a better girl than I would have been if I'd been the first one. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about Millie. Um, just tell me a little bit more about her. Well, she was a real jewel, really. Um, in those days, um, my dad didn't think that the girls were, you know, he wasn't keen on uh, whether they had an education or not. They, they went to school if they wanted to, and, and they could go through high school. But Millie would like to have gone on to college, but dad didn't see any sense in that. So he didn't, uh, I suppose that maybe if she'd really put pressure on him, uh, he would have sent her. But anyway, um, she didn't get to go to college, but she worked um, after she got out of high school. And, um, oh, maybe a couple of years before she was married. But anyway, she was the a type that liked to learn. She wanted to learn, she wanted to do everything. And she's the only one in the family that really learned how to play the piano. 
and uh, she had a great touch, and she enjoyed the piano, and she she was good at it. And uh, she, she kept on, you know, wanting to learn, and she did take some courses. I don't know whether she ever took any college courses per se or not, but um, she uh, learned shorthand and typing. Now, whether she got her shorthand in high school or not, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think she learned that afterwards. But anyway, she came, became quite a good secretary. And then uh, uh, when she lived in Hagerman, I don't know why they were kind of short on school teachers, or maybe just nobody wanted to go to Hagerman to live, to teach school. I don't know. But anyway, as she taught uh, business courses there in, in uh, the high school in Hagerman. And she knew her shorthand and her typing and her bookkeeping enough to, to teach uh, high school. And bless her little heart, she was just always wanting to learn and do things. <laughs> Tell me how her music played into the family life. Oh, it was great. Um, you know, in those days, they didn't have, well, when the kids, she was growing up, I don't think they had movies in town. But anyway, she and her friends, and Niall's friends, and Dick's friends, uh, they were all kind of close together there. They would get together on Sunday after church, and their entertainment, a lot of it was singing while Millie played the piano. I can remember, you know, a whole bunch of them gathering around the piano and, and singing the songs that were popular in those days. And I think I've told you before that I knew more of those words to the songs of that age than I did my own. <laughs> I haven't listened to them so many times. But uh, it was, uh, and I can still remember in my mind's eye, I have a picture of the bunch of them, you know, around that piano singing and having a good time on Sundays. <laughs> on Sundays? How was Sundays Sundays for you? afternoon, how, yeah. How did that work out in your family, Sundays and religion? And Great. Um, after, uh, of course, in those days we went to Sunday school at 10 o'clock and, and was out, oh, I don't know, before 12. And then uh, Mom always had the family there for Sunday dinner and any friends that they wanted to bring home. And uh, so they had a big Sunday dinner, and then they gathered around the piano and sang, I guess, while Mom did dishes. I don't know. <laughs> don't remember the dish part of it. <laughs> but there was always a lot to do, I know. Um, tell me your brothers' and sisters' names in their birth order, so that we kind of have okay. a, a record of it. And Heber, Heber Horatio was the oldest boy, and Ray Brady. Now those two lived to be about three and five. Uh, Heber was five and Ray was about three when they were in uh, Arizona. And they both died down there that summer, just a few months apart. And they were buried there in Mesa. And Niall was, had been born and was just a baby um, when they came back to Utah. And then Millie was born, and uh, then Denver J was his name, we always called him Dick. Um, then Reeves, then Martha. And those from Millie through Reeves were born in, or through Martha, was born in uh, Utah, in Fairview, in that area. And then they moved to uh, Idaho. Then Everett, Clyde, myself, and Dean were born in, in Idaho. And uh, so there was 11 all together, but she raised nine of us. That's interesting. Tell me what the boys did. You told me a little bit about Millie. Tell me what the boys... Well, um, like I say, Niall, uh, when they moved to Idaho, Niall was still in grade school. And we were one of the few Mormons up there. And uh, uh, we were uh, in an area that had a lot of uh, Missourians in it. Really? And some of this uh, hatred of Mormons had carried over 
to this area. Yeah. So when the Mormons, when we moved up there, uh, Niall said he had to fight his way to school and uh, in school and <laughs> his way back to st from school. There always somebody, you know, getting on him because he was a Mormon. And he was uh, a scrappy little character anyway, I guess. <laughs> then Millie, I don't remember her um, having too much trouble, maybe because she was a girl. But um, we weren't well <laughs> received in, in that area. By the time I got to school, there were several other LES. Well, we had a, a ward at that time, so we didn't have any problems uh, back that I was Mormon other than my uh, mother-in-law-to-be, and <laughs> I wasn't happy that her son was going to marry a Mormon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, what do you remember about holidays or special occasions in your family? I don't know as I remember anything but Christmas. Um, in fact, I didn't even know there was an Easter Bunny until Clydeen was born. <laughs> and one of Bob's aunts asked her what she was going to get, what the Easter Bunny was going to bring her, and I didn't know anything about the Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Christmas really was the only uh, one I can remember. But like I say, Sundays was kind of a holiday every every uh, week, you know. During the summertime, we always had a freezer of ice cream for dessert and all that. But, um, Christmas, uh, when I can start remembering, was during the Depression, and it was pretty sparse. But we lived about hmm, maybe three miles from the canyon of Little Salmon Creek, and in that canyon, um, the cedars grew. And uh, for years and years, uh, someone would go over in the canyon and cut our own Christmas tree and uh, bring it back from the canyon. And I was always in one corner of the front room, and they'd put their gifts around it. And then they, uh, Mom would tack a sheet up so we couldn't see the, the gifts. And then we, we couldn't get into them until after the chores were done, you know, and we had breakfast, and then we'd go open the gifts, and she had this sheet up to where there wasn't any peeking. <laughs> um, don't remember Fourth of July especially, you know, as I was growing up. Oh, and the 24th, I remember a few of those because after a while, uh, I was older, not too much older, 10, 11, something like that. I think that uh, the board uh, put on a, a 24th of July um, parade and um, in town. And the, the people in town participated a little bit and made a, a thing out of it. I had that for several years. I remember um, one time I had a dime that I could spend on pop or whatever they had in the concessions. So after Dean and I looked over everything, we thought we'd settle on a bottle of pop. And I picked up a bottle that was dark brown. I thought I had a bottle of root beer. I don't know whether I didn't read the thing or didn't know what it was supposed to be. Anyway, I got the bottle, paid for it, and opened it up, and it was the nastiest stuff I'd ever had. I couldn't figure out what it was. I knew it wasn't root beer. <laughs> Found out it was Coca-Cola. <laughs> and there I'd spent my dime on it. <laughs> it was sad. <laughs> um, we really haven't mentioned much that you lived on a farm. What was farm life like? Oh, um, it was full of rocks, <laughs> that I know. <laughs> we were, um, a creek ran through it we, that had 20 acres or so on the west side of the creek, and that's where our house was. 
the rest of it. <laughs> um, we were talking about the rocks and the creek. Oh. And, then ha and it was 20 acres. Right. And then uh, he had another 80 acres or so on the east side of the creek. And also the schoolhouse had a uh, two acre lot in that. Um, so we had the schoolhouse right just across the creek from us, which was a good thing with all of us kids going to school. But um, he had that, and then he rented another 40 acres, what they called an inside 40, from a man named Foster. I can't remember his first name, but it was Mr. Foster, and we always called, referred it to as Foster as he was up there working, you know. And uh, one thing about that, Foster had some kind of business in town. I can't remember what it was, but uh, he rented that. Forty to Dad, all the time was there, and it was a. I don't remember just what the portion was. Was it half and half? I, I imagine Dad got more than half of it. Anyway, uh, they never did have any written contract for anything. They just settled on something in themselves, and and that's the way it was. And Foster knew that he wasn't going to get uh, cheated any, and and Dad knew that Foster wasn't going to give him a bad time, so that's the way it was, and for years that's, uh, they formed Foster's 40. And uh, we had pasture on the east side of the creek for the cows. Always had a big herd of cows. If they hadn't had that, we'd have starved. Because between the cows and the chickens, uh, we kept and the pigs. We could eat well and, <laughs> and had a little money left over from the uh, eggs and the milk to do a little something with. But uh, anything he made on the farm uh, paid his land payment and his water bill for irrigation. And uh, uh, I think he had something else. He had to pay with his crop, and he was lucky to get that much out of his crops, and the rest of it we lived off the cows and, and the chickens. Um, and the chickens was Mom's um, area, and when I got, uh, you know, old enough, uh, I was her only help because my uh, sister, older than myself, was married early, and she was gone. Seemed to me like I was always mom's <laughs> right hand man. <laughs> I got to do it all. <laughs> You'll have to tell me those stories. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but the chickens, we uh, I guess I can't remember. But we had a double crate. I can't remember how many dozen that held. I want to say 36, but I'm not sure whether they were that big or not. I don't remember. But anyway, we had to uh, uh, make sure they were the eggs were clean, and we canneled them to make sure that they were good. You know, didn't, they weren't spoiled. And uh, then we put them in these big crates, and we would have one of those at least once a week to go to the store where we could buy our groceries and, if we were lucky, have a few things left, or a little money left out of And that was Mom's money. And she's the one that gave Everett and Clyde a dollar each every week for their date night on Saturday. And uh, Everett would go spend his whole dollar. <laughs> but Clyde and Pat uh, would uh, be kind of careful, so Clyde had a little left over. <laughs> Never went long till Everett had borrowed guides left over, so <laughs> that's the way it went. <laughs> so tell me about some of your chores then with your mom. Oh, well, I was a workaholic. <laughs> and nobody will believe that. But uh, In the summertime, we had a raspberry patch. It was over on the other side of the creek. 
just south of the school. And so it was quite a little walk for Mom, unless I got up when I got older and could drive the car and drive her over, or one of the boys would drive her over. Her over. But she would give me her choice. I said, are you going to go pick berries, Mary, or are you going to get breakfast? Well, I didn't like to cook, so I usually took the berries. Not always. <laughs> so we had quite a big patch. It'd take us several hours to get them picked. And after we got the dumb things picked, we had to go put them up. Uh, and she'd put up a, a hundred quarts fresh for herself and a bunch of jam. And then we'd start bottling it for Anna and Millie and <laughs> all the rest of the family till we run out of <laughs> raspberries and that took all summer. We'd do raspberries. And then she always had a big garden, and I kind of helped there, and I don't know, a heck of a lot of help, but um, I had to weed some, and, and she didn't trust me with the hoe. <laughs> and another thing, we, uh, of course, it would eat chicken, because she uh, had always chicken, and we always had fryers when they, uh, she would get a bunch of little ones, and then We'd raise them till they got to we'd eat the fryers, the the roosters, and then she'd save most of the hens to lay eggs. But uh, so when we killed a chicken, <laughs> she never let me wield the axe either. <laughs> but she was good. But she wanted she'd hold the feet, and I had to hold the comb of the chicken, and we'd get it over this chopping block, and she she was pretty good, though. She never did get my fingers. <laughs> she got the neck of the chicken. <laughs> and then we had to <laughs> scald the thing and pick it, and, and I even learned how to uh, cut it up, clean it. I didn't do that for a long while, but the last little while I finally learned how to do that. <laughs> I'm sure glad we got chicken all cut up <laughs> in packages for us now. But that was a mess, and the smell of the old wet feathers was pretty nasty, too. Um, and I'd help out in the barn once in a while. The, I was kind of half scared of the cows, didn't really want to do it, but um, by the time I got, well, I tried to milk, but I just wasn't. My hands weren't strong enough. I didn't really get enough practice to really milk them by hand. But I had to run the milkers every once in a while. And uh, I, I wasn't really uh, good at that either. <laughs> but I, I did it occasionally. But cleaning, uh, we um, had a, a cream separator. And uh, that was my job, was to wash that dumb... Uh, separator after we got through, because they separated quite a bit of the milk, maybe five gallons, maybe more, I don't remember, because they would feed the calves, the small calves, the um, separated the skim milk, and then she would use the cream for various things, but the separator was a ch ch chore to clean, they had the tank that they put it in, the milk in, and then it went through a, I don't even know what it was called now, a cylinder with a bunch of discs in it, and then it come out, the milk come out one way and the cream out of another spout. Don't know if you've ever seen one, have you? And uh, so, but then I had to clean that, and the, this bowl that did the separating had Oh, at least 25 discs in it, and I had to take that apart and clean each one of those discs. So it was a kind of a chore to get that clean. We took the, uh, we'd clean the rest of it all, but the the separator part, and the big uh, one with the discs, we'd take the house and clean it with soap and water. You know. The rest of it we would just run through the machine, you know, make sure it was clean. But, uh, 
and then the dumb old chicken coop. <laughs> I hated that job. Because they would get mites, you know, in them. And the, I had the roost that was up. I don't know how to really describe it, but strips of wood across where the chickens could roost up. But then we had a, a, a solid wood underneath the roost to where they, uh, when they did the reed BM and all the, the feathers that flew and all this stuff would come down onto this one platform. So every once in a while we had to raise up that, the roost, and then clean the crap out of the, off of the things. And then we had to spray it with a, a Lysol solution, I think is what she made, to keep the mites down and the chickens clean and, and, and healthy. But that was an all a chore I hated to do too. Of course, I didn't have to do it by myself, I helped my mom, but um, well, I was just busy from morning to night, <laughs> working my little fingers to the bone. <laughs> I remember you telling me about wallpapering and, and oh, decorating. Oh, yes, indeedy. I can first remember that we used calcimine. You don't even hear of it anymore. But uh, it was. That's what they uh, used rather than paint on the plaster, this is calcimine. And, but it went on like a, a thin paint. It had different colors. And, um, but then when I got to helping, she decided on paper. And our ceilings were at least eight feet tall, maybe nine, I don't know. But then they had a uh, picture molding that run around about a foot down from the ceiling all the way around. So above the picture molding and across the top she figured was ceiling. And so we had to do that in ceiling paper which was just you know plain white maybe a little figure on it not much no flowers or anything you know plain for a ceiling paper. And to start that ceiling paper, she would cut it and paste it, and that was true. Okay, back to the ceiling. Go ahead. Okay. And she'd get it ready to put up, and then it was up to me to get up on the ladder and, and try to get it up. So uh, it was a, a struggle. Our front room was fairly big fairly wide. It was um, about 14 feet wide, maybe. So we'd have to cut it in two because it was just more than I could handle, you know. To, uh, but I papered that front room two or three times, I think. <laughs> and then when we got to the walls, and that wasn't so bad, but it just came down from the um, molding down to the mop board, so that, that wasn't bad until I had to turn corners or go around the chimney. Uh, that's, we had a, a standing stove in the front room to uh, heat it in the summer t or winter time, but we had this chimney that came out part way and the wall, and that was not all that much fun trying to paper around that chimney. But otherwise, that wasn't too bad. And we, we kept the dining room and the uh, front room papered most of my time out there. And, to, and then to clean it, the paper, after it had been up a year or so, they had uh, something like, it uh, looked like the crazy putty, whatever the kids used to play with. You know, you, I then play doh. I guess that's more like, but that's what we cleaned the the paper with, because of that coal stove. We were bound to get some smoke and, and stuff on the paper, so we'd rub that stuff on the thing, and it worked pretty good. 
it rubbed off the smoke and dirt pretty good tell me a little bit more about um, the summer house and the siblings and and how everybody fit in and did you have problems uh, or stories that you want to share along that line no we had a few problems yes <laughs> Sister Martha had a hard time with one of her sister-in-laws, <laughs> and I had a hard time with one of my brother-in-laws. Just, <laughs> we just didn't appreciate them a bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, we didn't uh, have any knockdowns and rags out. It was just uh, Martha used to say that uh, Martha was smaller and, and energetic. You know, moved fast and. Uh, on things done, you know, uh, in a hurry. But uh, our sister-in-law Blanche moved fairly slow. <laughs> and during the uh, depression, uh, uh, silk hose is what we wore. Uh, it was silk, and um, uh, they snagged pretty easy. You know, and Martha, with her hustle and bustle, was always going through socks and you know, snagging them and r making them run. And, but Blanche could wear a pair of hose for quite a long while. And Martha said, well, yes. She said, hang slow that she can unhook it if it gets snagged. <laughs> and J.W. Rutherford just rubbed me the wrong way, and I'm sure I did him too. But, uh, <laughs> it's much older than I was. I, I, I was just a, you know, a thorn in his side. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember of any really any blow-ups. We just got along. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, us kids would get to uh, quarreling and jangling and running around, and, uh, wanting to whip it <laughs> each other. Uh, Mom would say, "You kids are going to drive me to Blackfoot. You're sending me to Blackfoot." Uh, Blackfoot was our mental health, our me <laughs> mental <laughs> asylum. <you know? laughs> and, state of Idaho. You know, she gets her sending me to Blackfoot. <laughs> I don't know how she escaped it. I really don't. <laughs> well, tell me about the time when she'd had enough and she'd travel. Oh, she would uh, go uh, take care of her mother. Now, I was thinking that today. I, I don't know what Grandma's problem was, but she every once in a while had to go to bed. She would sick and, and she'd be in bed. And of course, Mom felt that she should take her turn. That she had a lot of brothers and sisters, but Mom felt that she should take her turn taking care of her mother. So she would go down and stay at her mother's in Fairview. Uh, she'd be gone a month, maybe, you know, something like that. But then they had Martha and Nellie would fill in. And, and once she was down, when I was older, and I had to do the cooking and and getting dad's breakfast and, <laughs> and neither none of us was thrilled about that <laughs> him not wanting to eat my food and me not wanting to cook it <laughs> he was a dear old soul he never <laughs> did anything but try to eat it but um, she did she went down several times just to uh, and i'm sure that's saved her sanity uh, quite a bit, but we just have to do without her for a few weeks. Once she took Dean and I down with her, I evidently intended to stay longer, so she took Dean and I while we were still small. I was in school, but um, uh, was, I was about to finish up that year or something. We were gone a while, and uh, I guess Martha was home to run the I don't remember. But did Mom liked to travel otherwise, too. You know, she, she never did get to go very far or do very many things, but she did like to travel. And when we, uh, she went any place, of course, we didn't have a lot of restaurants, no fast foods, and she didn't have the money for restaurants anyway. So she always packed a lunch for us for, if we were going to be gone the whole day or something. And uh, they used to tease her because we lived four miles 
out of town and we always went through town to get any place and then the railroad tracks were just east of town a little bit and they used to tease her that she was ready to give in to her lunch by the time she would cross the railroad tracks <laughs> which was about six miles from home. <laughs> but, uh, one time I remember I was 14. I was just going into high school, I think, that summer. And uh, she, she uh, wrangled it so she had all kids, all the married kids, and, and um, all but uh, Dean and Everett. They had to stay home and milk cows and, and take care of their things. But we all went to uh, Yellowstone Park all in, oh, I don't know, we must have had six cars, <laughs> we were kind of a caravan of us anyway, and we had to take our own bedding and everything, they slept out, they camped out, and, and did their cooking over a fire and various things, but we had several days up there, and it was a good time. And the older kids really enjoyed it and had a lot of fun together, and their wives, and the, I don't think they had their little kids with them, but they had their wives with them. And I was 14 and I was moaning and groaning part of the time because I got tired of uh, paint pots and, and geysers and rocks. You know, that's all I could see. Geysers and rocks. I was tired of seeing this. <laughs> Just an ornery little snot, really. <laughs> but. Uh, um, <laughs> be a, a whole row of beds, you know, <laughs> quilts on the ground. <laughs> they were all having a good time, you know, giving each other. And then uh, once Mom had a, some cans of tomatoes that she'd bought, and I don't know what else she had, but she had tomatoes that we were eating. And one of them had found a worm in one of the things, one of the, the brothers. So they slept around and put it in one of the brother-in-law's dish <laughs> and waited for it. <laughs> and when he just about got it ready to eat while they told him, <laughs> no, no, look what you've got. <laughs> and he was such a quiet character anyway, this brother-in-law. <laughs> uh, I don't know really how the in-laws ever put up with the rest of us. I really don't. <laughs> but we had, we had a good time. A lot of fun when we got all together. Tell me a little bit more about um, your neighbors. You mentioned them. Oh, the ones I remember lived across, we had ones right across the road, and they were Missourians. And uh, they had um, two older kids that were older than uh, like Niles and Millie's age, something like that. And they weren't there very much. But the two girls that were Everett's and Clyde's age, excuse me, we played back and forth together with them. And in this summer months, we were out, excuse me, had big long evenings, you know, after the chores with them. Then we'd play hide and seek or run sheep run and kick the can and various things that, you know, we'd. And uh, Everett and Clyde had friends that lived up the road about a mile and a half from us the other way. And they were always there, and, and the girls from across the street, and I don't know how many more, that we would get together quite a bit and, and play in the evenings. Then we had a, after the threshing was done, we had a nice new fresh trough <laughs> stack to play in. And, uh, Dad told us repeatedly to stay off that straw stack, but he knew we wouldn't, you know, but we'd get it to where uh, we'd wasted a lot of straw because we would get it down off the stack and, and playing around in it that really wasn't good to use for anything else after a while. But that straw stack was fun to play in, and, and so was our granary. They would fill it full of wheat for... Uh, cattle and I don't know what all I used it for, but I, I used to like to play in there until 
I'd find a mouse, and then, then <laughs> if I'd see a mouse, I'd leave the darn thing and plant the grain right there. But and we had a silo that we uh, they chopped the green corn, uh, the cobs, and and all the whole stock was chopped up for a silage that we'd feed the cows, and that was fun as they were filling the silo. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. They had these rungs that went, went around it every so often. And uh, as they filled the silo, they had boards that went on the inside of the rungs uh, to hold the fodder from coming down the chute until they got ready to bring it down, you know. And uh, so as they filled it up, just left the rungs out where you could climb them and so that was fun for all of us to climb up in the silo and play on the, si the uh, silage and uh, as they used it you know and opened it up again I, we'd have the wider step you know play and then we'd uh, jump down into the silo off of the steps I still have a scar on my knee for when my big tooth hit my knee. <laughs> Just cutting that big tooth, I guess. Or but I still have the scar there where <laughs> I banged my knee there. But that was a fun thing to do. And another fun thing was our windmill. We had up uh, a ways, it was a little rise that, uh, where they got the well, and then they had a pipe down. Uh, to the house, and it just came down by gravity. They didn't have any pump on it. But uh, we were warned away from staying, you know, the windmill, because we had a cistern there at the bottom of the windmill, and it was certainly a no-no for us to look into the cistern. But we did that occasionally, too. But uh, we would climb up on the windmill, and there was just a little seat that we could get up on at the side of the, the wheel that went around. Well, I never went up when the brake was off and the wheel was going. I didn't climb it. But other than that, when the thing was still, if we wanted to climb up there, we'd get up and climb and sit on the seat. And that was a no-no. <laughs> it was a fun thing to do. <laughs> it sounds like you need to tell me about your parents. <laughs> Well, <laughs> they were just very good people. <laughs> Pretty slow to anger. <laughs> the only time my dad ever gave me any uh, grief was <laughs> I was talking back to my mom once, giving her a little sass. And I happened to be out on the front porch, and it was up one or two steps from the ground, I can't remember, maybe just one step and then the porch. And uh, Dad happened to be there and, and heard what I was doing and he, he just took the side of his foot and kicked my fanny and I went sailing off that porch. <laughs> and that's the only time I ever remember him giving me any problem. <laughs> Tell me more about this foot kicking and your dad. Well, the boys got it every once in a while. Uh, Dean tells me he got it <laughs> fairly often, and he said that his dad would have been a great place kicker. <laughs> uh, that he'd been a good football player. But, uh, yeah, I thought he had a physical... Oh, yeah, when he was young man before he's married in his 20s, early 20s, he um, had a team of horses that he worked in the uh, lumber up on the mountain that he called it out of Fairview. And this, he was getting timber out and this one horse reared and uh, hit that in the head with his sh the horse's shoe which broke his skull and, and uh, uh, knocked him out, of course, and 
they had it took him quite a while to get him down off the mountain and to a doctor. But the doctor took out what loose bone he could find of the skull and uh, sewed him sewed his skull back up. And uh, he come around <laughs> all right and and uh, they didn't put a plate in or anything. He still had that hole in his head with the so it was an indentation, you know, and we could uh, see his pulse in <laughs> his head. We'd look at it every once in a while. <laughs> sure was, but it was, and, and but it did affect his. Um, uh, I think it was his left arm and leg. Uh, he didn't have the strength in his left hand as it uh, should have had. Would have had. So he would, when he was milking a cow, he would hold the bucket with his left hand and, and milk with his right, because his left was just not a, he couldn't squeeze it tight enough. And he always had just a little, on the limp, but she could hear him walk and, and his one foot kind of slapped the floor and you could tell it was him walking, you know, because this one foot just had a little slap to it. And uh, they didn't, you know, for a few days they didn't know whether he'd live or not, but that's what he come out with was just a little paralysis or something, a weakness on his left side. And I can say that happened before he was married, a few years before. He wasn't married till he was 29, so 28 or 29. <coughs> and his mom had worked uh, for his half sister. I think Uncle Aunt Rose was his half sister, and uh, because his dad had two wives, so that's what well, Aunt Rose was one of the other wives' kids, I guess. And uh, Mom worked for her, and that's where they met. And uh, she was just a little thing, uh, five two, ninety-eight pounds. Uh, when they were married, but, uh, he was ten years older, but, and she was wondering if she wanted to marry somebody that much older than her. And one of her wise sisters said, "You better be a old man's darling than a young man's slave." <laughs> and that's what she was. She was a young man's darling, and he just. He gave her everything he could possibly give her in the way of, uh, um, well, household help, you know, uh, never did hire anybody to help her, but she had her stove and vacuum and anything that he could uh, buy to help her with her work. Tell me about the glass cabinet or china hutch. Okay. Well, the house, when they built it, Uh, it was, I guess, just four rooms, big ones, just kind of divided into four rooms when it was first built. But when I was about five, uh, four or five, they remodeled it. And uh, the kitchen was a pretty good size, and then the dining room. And what um, they did was they uh, had the cupboards that were between the kitchen and the dining room open on both sides so where she could put the dishes in from the kitchen side and take them out on the dining room side. And I didn't uh, ever remember the dining room side having glass doors, but I was told uh, by my sister Martha that yes, they had glass, when they started them, they uh, finished up, they had glass doors on the dining room side. So the dishes showed uh, and they could see, I guess, on the cupboard and everything in the uh, kitchen. But uh, she's the one that <laughs> changed them from glass to a, a plain board when I was. <laughs> she said she got mad one day and threw a broom <laughs> into the glass doors and broke one or two of them. <laughs> so they took the glass out and just put a, a plain board there, so when I come along I'm good and remember 
it would just it would shut the kitchen up and you couldn't see the mess on the other side if it was a mess and uh, it was uh, quite an inventive little thing it saved us uh, you know from getting into the kitchen in the way when we were setting the table because we could do it from that and the silverware drawer uh, went both ways you could pull it out in the kitchen or you could pull it out in the dining room so it was pretty neat when you set the table you didn't have to go into the kitchen to do it tell me more about the inventions your dad oh. kind of got together the on one the farm. where they uh, tried to um, uh, get their own electricity we had that creek that was running down there and it ran water the whole year so they built a, a partial dam and put in a, um, what do they call it, a thing, a turbine. A water wheel? And they had the water wheel all right, and then they had something else that would turn to make the electricity. The water wheel turned this thing, the generator, I guess is what they called it. Anyway, we generated our own electricity for a while. And, uh, of course, Idaho Power frowned on that. They wanted to sell us the power, you know, they didn't want us to generate, generate our own. But we did for a while, and uh, then uh, one spring, I guess it was, it had a runoff in the creek. And something happened anyway, it broke, broke something or other. So Idaho Power paid him some fun, some money for uh, I don't know whether they took the generator or what they did, you know, but paid him some so he didn't make his own electricity. So <laughs> rather than fix it up again, he just took what money the idle bar gave him and, and we didn't <laughs> do the electricity anymore. <laughs> uh, well, when we had our own spud sorter, that, uh, they, and we had our own potato cellar, and that was fun when uh, they dug this, um, big spot for the potato cellar. It was a big one. You need to drive a truck down into it, so it was, it was a good size. I don't know what time, how big, but um, they dug it out one summer and didn't get the rest of it done till later. So that one summer, um, the water from the irrigation run into it, and Dean and I had a swimming pool. <laughs> We thought that was pretty neat, but then they um, they went up in the South Hills and got their own uh, timbers for the uh, roof of the the cellar. They cut out the little ridge pole pines or something. I remember Dick was old enough and had his truck then, I think, and and they went up and got their own timbers and and built the top of the potato cellar. And they put these timbers on it, kind of like eaves of a roof. And then they put um, uh, wire across that. I don't know if it was just chicken wire, if it was the net wire, or what it was, don't remember. And then they put straw over that and then dirt over top of the straw. And that's, uh, they could keep the potatoes that way all summer, all winter without them freezing usually and uh, so they would put the potatoes in that and then um, during the winter they would sort them and, and uh, cull them up and sack them and uh, did their own sacking and sell them by the sack and one year I remember during the depression there just wasn't any sale of potatoes at all and the um, government paid them a little for them to buy them and uh, then let them feed them to the pigs. But they uh, dyed them purple. So we couldn't sell them, you know, to somebody to eat after the government bought them. And uh, so I remember seeing those purple potatoes that we fed the pigs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> couldn't sell them, you know, no market for them. And uh, so the government gave them a little bit to help them out. 
Well, we're just about at the end of this tape, and kind of childhood, I think um, we'll come back and do another time, but is there anything else about your childhood that you hmm, kind of like to, you've know. been thinking about? I can't think of anything special. I've already told you about <laughs> climbing all, I might tell you about the, uh, um, we had a, a pig pen that was, Pen, and then it had a um, net over some uh, eaves and straw on top of that to make the pig pen. Uh, had quite a few pigs in it, sow and new pigs and everything. And uh, Dean one time was playing with matches <laughs> in this straw.